All right, we've got our dough laid out here. We're getting ready to go. And uh, the, it, what I'm pointing at is there is the Bega dough, which was the wetter of the two at the top. And then the other dough experiment is down at the bottom. Sorry I had to do a voiceover here, but uh, we had the radio playing actually pretty loud in the background. I just cannot remember to turn off that dadgum radio. We know what happens if you don't. They get all excited. Um, and I found out that this program I'm using does have a filter. It can filter out some low radio, but it could not filter out this. So, voiceover. Sorry about that. All right, so we used uh, some tomato sauce right out of the jar. There was no need for as far as we were concerned to get fancy or anything like that. And uh, what we did was uh, the wife took the one at the top and she made a combination style pizza. And all I wanted was nothing more than a, uh, a basic pepperoni pizza. Oh, I like combination pizzas, but I just wanted a basic pepperoni pizza with some mozzarella cheese. Now you notice we made our pizzas right there on the pizza peel itself. If you're not familiar with that term novices, the pizza peel is the big handled jobber that uh, that's not it. It was the one that we were building the pizzas on. All right. If you do that, and you can, make sure you put down either in a flour or I uh, forget what that yellow stuff's called. It's kind of grainy that you can put down. Something so that your pizzas can just slide off of it. We allow those pizzas to sit there too long, and what they did was soak up the um, flour and actually kind of stick to the peel, and we almost had to start over. We were taking some temperatures there, and the temperatures were coming in at about uh, 700 degrees. Okay, and as you can see, uh, they're, they're starting to firm up, whereas when I f first pushed that thing in, they were kind of like still wet. Uh, a little bit more flame would have been nice, and we ended up adding some more wood. See, there you go. Need some more flame. So we uh, added a little bit more wood once we got that pizza out of there and uh, everything came out really well. Uh, you gotta have a good flame when you're doing pieces or your edge is not gonna get crisp. It's gonna take much longer. Now, I'm, I'm not a fanatic at all about gotta have that pizza in one minute. You know, I, I geez, I don't care. Two minutes is fine with me. Uh, I just want it done well. I want it done crispy and I wanna be happy with it. Uh, I took a chance there and added a couple of pieces of wood while the pizza was in there because with my luck, I'm going to drop it dead on top of that pizza. But I didn't and kept going around and around and around and getting the pizzas done and uh, things turned out pretty good. All right. So here we are on the second firing. We finished the burn in. We did some pizzas. <laughs> that was a current a kerning lerve. Yeah, that was a learning curve of getting the dough. And, and there's going to be a lot of work on which dough recipe I think I use because they're not all the same. And eh, well, I'm going to find one that works eventually. And I'm sure you will too. All right, but just getting them round and everything, and do right, really care if they're perfectly round. They're not gonna go in the septic tank round, so I'm not worried about them going down round, okay? No big deal, but just manageable. So, pieces weren't too bad. Got a little learning curve on it, like I said. But this time, remember, I said early on, we're gonna cook more than pizzas in here. Not for what this dadgum thing costs, and the next video is going to be a breakdown of things I'd maybe do different. And I said some things that I would do different that I'm going to change again on the next video. All right, we'll talk about that. So don't lose the last video. That's going to be interesting, I think. And we're going to break down the costs. How much did this bad boy cost to build? All right. So what are we going to do for the meal? This is a meal. I want to cook something other than just pizzas in here. So I've gone through the net over and over and over again in the tube and all this kind of good stuff. And there are several good good uh, uh, videos out there and channels out there. Uh, the Wood Fired Oven Chef and, and Cooking with Fire and, and a few of these other guys. I hope they don't mind me mentioning their names. Please don't sue me. Um, and, and I'm going to make some of my own modifications to them. Uh, for example, today 
one of the things we're going to try and do is a spatchcock chicken. Now, the difference between the one that you will see on the tube most of the time about doing a spatchcock chicken is they use one big whole chicken. Well, the way me and the, and the other half eat, we're both pretty old, like I, you know I'm in my 70s, so we don't really eat as much as we used to and things like that. So instead of doing a whole chicken and having a lot of it sit around for a while, we're going to do two small Cornish hens. So I guess you could call that spatchcock Cornish hens, okay? And we'll show you that inside here in a minute. Uh, so that's going to be an experiment. We're also going to do some roasted potatoes. We're going to try and see how those come out. We're going to try and do some roasted onions and some roasted tomatoes, each in its own separate little container. And then I want to try something that I've done on my smoker over and over and over again, on my grill over and over and over again, but obviously never in here. I'm going to take some vegetables, basically broccoli, wrap it up in tin foil, and see how a tin foil package cooks in here. Now there's one thing that's very important to me and, and to you, whether you're a novice pizza oven builder or whatever if you cook, you know that when you've got friends coming over and you want to sit down at the meal, you want everything done at the same time. Yeah, that ain't working. Alright, you want everything done at the same time. You don't want to start your two minute cook product first and then put on your half hour cook product where you have to wait a half hour and your two minute product's already done, right? So you want everything to come together, be ready, be hot, be tasty, ready to serve at the same time. I don't want to say it's my biggest fear, but it's my biggest lack of experience with this bad boy on what are the cook times, all right? Supposedly in one of the vids, uh, spatchcock kitchen, chickens, uh, uh, cook it wrapped up 25 minutes, unwrap it, do it another five or 10 till it's brown, ready to go. Okay, well, that's cool. I hope that's the way it works and that's what I'm gonna, that's gonna be my basis, okay? For example, I think the potatoes may take a little while longer, so I may put them in first, then the chicken, okay? Then the onions, then the tomatoes, and, and but there may be a time where they're all in there at the same time. I don't know, but that's why I made it big and long, okay? So I'll put the fire to the side so I got heat coming in from everywhere, and we'll be able to check things out. That's why I built the shelf here instead of nothing up front, all right? So timing is key, and that's something that, you know, I'm going to have to learn to adjust because the timing for my my pizza oven versus the timing for my grill versus the timing for either of my smokers all those time and plus the timing of my kitchen oven all those timings are going to be a little bit different we'll see what happens okay so fire's going oh heck yeah that fire is going and uh, we'll let temps come up and everything and in between there let's go in and I'll show you the dishes that I'm going to uh, be doing today. Let's go. All right, let's take a look at uh, one of the dishes we're going to do for the main meal. We've, like I said, we've already done pizzas. Didn't build that for just the pizza oven. There's a meal out there, or rather a, uh, a uh, yeah, meal called Spatchcock Kitchen. Chicken Kitchen, yeah. As I mentioned outside, we're not going to do a whole chicken. We're going to use Cornish hens because that's more for our eating habits than chicken. You want to use a full chicken? No sweat. Alright. So what we do, start off by putting a bit of olive oil in a pan and I'm actually using a cast iron Okay, get yourself some time. Time ain't on my side. Lay that down. Okay. Now what we're going to do is take our little chickadees right here. And put them in. Oh. 
right on top of that. Okay? No biggie da. I'm going to put some olive oil over the top. Rub that in. Try to keep one hand dry. It's, I seldom succeed, but try. And then what we're going to do is you can chop up some thyme. It's what most recipes call for. But I'm just going to go ahead and use straight out of the store thyme leaves. Okay? No big deal. And at the same time, no pun intended, put a sprig or two on top. There we go. All right. <clears throat> now what else we're going to do? Put in here is something, sometimes called a mirefoix. A mirefoix is basically the three things of garlic, onions, celery, some carrots, things like that. All right. And I've got that sitting over here, pre-cut. Some of the stuff you can pre-do. Alright. And we're just going to pour that in. And we're going to get some in the pan. Well, make sure to leave the meat exposed. Don't cover the meat. Put these on the side. This pan's a tad small, but it's the only pan that I, I had a bigger steel pan. But when I read the box, it came in. It said it was cleared for five up to five hundred degrees. Well, that's not going to cut it. All right. So we'll go that route, <clears throat> and then what we're going to do is put some white wine in there. Now, the recipe that I saw called for a dry vermouth. The only problem is, you try to find a dry vermouth in, in the town that I live in, all right? As I go around, I'm going to be looking for some dry vermouths and stuff like that, but for deciding to do this two days ago and then trying to find dry vermouth, that was not going to happen. And we're kind of strange here in North Carolina. You can buy liquor in a liquor store controlled by the state when you can buy wine and beer in a grocery store even on a Sunday but you have to wait till noon on a Sunday so you go into a food line or wherever and there's a long group of people hanging there waiting for 12 noon so they can take their wine home or their beer home for the weekend or whatever poor prior planning I guess but that's the way this state works and vermouth, that's kind of a strange thing, so most of the grocery stores do not handle it. So we're just going to put a little dash of wine in there. No biggie duck. The driest wine you have. And that certainly isn't a dry wine, all that dry that I'm using today, but it's the white wine that I have. All right, <clears throat> so that is basically what we're going to stick into the, the oven with one more thing to do to it. I got to come over here because I wasn't 100% prepared, I guess. And I got to get me some... Aluminum foil. Alright, get a big piece of aluminum foil that you can double over because you want to double wrap this thing. Make it nice and tight.
So there we go. That's our spatch cock chicken slash Cornish hens. Not hard to do at all. So we'll see how it works out. Let me show you something else we're going to put in there. All right. What's the next thing we're going to do? We're going to have put in there. We're going to have some roasted potatoes. All right. Just a tad of olive oil drizzled along the bottom. And when you buy these big things of olive oil, it's got these little pop tops. Don't just pop them out of there, all right? Crack them. You may have to turn this a little bit with a pair of pliers, but just crack it. And then that way, you see how you can take a big thing and just drizzle it a little bit? Real handy. Real handy. Okay? Okay, I've pre-done my potatoes as well in a gallon bag. I've taken some uh, small white fingerlings. I've cut them in half, okay? Put some olive oil in there. I've put some Herbe de Provence. Now, Herbe de Provence is nothing more than a fancy name for a combination of different other herbs. You'll find rosemary, thyme, all kinds of different herbs in there, and it gives you an interesting flavor profile, which we like, all right? And I put them in a plastic bag with the oil. That way, if you just cut potatoes and leave them open, they're going to turn colors, all right? You need to either put them in water, put some oil on them, do something with it. You just can't leave them. So I put them in this bag with the oil. In there, I put the herb de Provence. I put some salt, some pepper, a little bit of garlic, powdered garlic, nothing fancy. And I put in some, uh, believe it or not, some, where did it go, where did it go? I'll show you. Some Old Bay, not an advertisement, I get no money from them, but I put Old Bay, like commercial says, I put that beep on everything. Okay, is that the commercial that does that? I don't know. Let's squeeze out all this goodness. Where have I done this before? All right. Put it over there in sink, let it set. <clears throat> Got to be careful with it. <clears throat> All right, spread them out. Why? Because we're going to cook these things for a while, covered. And then we're going to take the cover off and see if we can crisp them up a bit. All right, that's the goal. We want to crisp them up. And I have. I think there's two things that's going to take a while in the oven. These taters, all right, I think these taters are going to take a while. There we go. These taters, and I think the, chip, the Cornish hens are going to take a while. But we'll just have to see. I think that's my two long things. All right, so we got that done. Get a little bit of this oil off my fingers. Let's go get some more. Tin foil. Well, I tell you what, I'm the guy that keeps Reynolds wrap alive and flirt. There we go. We're going to double up on that bad boy, too. Why are we doubling up? A lot of heat. Lots, lots, a lot of heat out there. Get it nice and tight. Here we go. Meal component number two, the potatoes. So what are we going to do next? We want to roast some tomatoes or tomatoes or maters. All right, we're doing our tomatoes here. I had to do this again because even though I'm using my new camera, I looked up, the screen went to totally blank, turned itself off again. I have no idea what's going on with this camera because that's what the old camera was doing after I dropped it a couple of times and I've never dropped this one. Anyway, so let's go over this again. We're using the tomatoes that come on the little vine. You can get them in the packages, no big deal. We put a little olive oil in there, all right? Got the olive oil all squirted away. Put some olive oil on top of these and I did a little herb de Provence. I didn't put any salt and pepper and what I explained earlier was and apparently got lost. 
The reason I don't put salt and pepper on these and some of the other things as well where I go very light is my other half can't eat salt, a lot of salt that bothers me physically. I love it. I mean, I'm like a cow. I can sit there and lick on a salt lick all day. But if you have five or six guests over, you're going to have five or six different salt profiles that some like a lot of salt, some don't. That's where our salt shaker comes in. Kind of irks me to hear all these professional chefs on TV going, oh, well, you needed more salt. If I was the chef he was grading, I'd reach in my pocket and say, well, there you go, dummy. This is called a salt shaker. Let me show you how to use it. I mean, come on. Everybody's different. So there's my little rant for the day. But that's how we do the, uh, uh, the tomatoes. And <clears throat> I'm going to cover them at first. I don't know if they need to be covered. I've seen them uncovered. I, you know, everybody does it a different way. But what I'm going to do is cover them up and see how that goes. All right. So all I got to do is help support the Reynolds Wrap Company again. Give me some Reynolds Wrap. Double it over. Again, doubling it because of the heat involved out there. There we go. Alright, so now we've got spatchcock chicken, corner shins, we've got our potatoes, now we have our tomatoes. Alright, here's another little item we're going to put out there in the oven today. Baked onions. What I used to do, and it's only been recently that I tried this and it, I really like how it came out. I used to do potatoes in the oven, okay, when we would have steaks and stuff like that. I'd put those small potatoes in the oven in a pan and just cook them for about 40, 50 minutes, I mean, about 50 minutes or so, you know, and uh, they'd be nice, tender. Now, originally, I would chop up onion and mix with them. Onion always disappeared. It was gone. Or it was, like, dissolved or burned up. And then I started putting um, bigger chunks in. Same, same result. And then for some reason one day I took one of these onions, cut them in half, and I just laid it down flat in the pan, put the potatoes around it, and oh my goodness, the bottom meat got a little bit charred, but not much, but it was so good. It was, oh, it would just melt in your mouth. So that's what I've done this time. Cut an onion in half, and what I did was break the the hold of the seal of the different leaves, okay? The hold of the seal of the different leaves. And I would sprinkle some um, olive oil down there. And something else as well. Let me show you. This is probably going to make the chefs out there just throw up. I don't know. But this is Orville Redenbacher popcorn oil. Okay? Yeah. I'd say that again. Oral Redenbacher popcorn oil. No, I don't get any money from Orville. He's probably dead. You know. I love that Jimmy Dean's dead and the kids nowadays have no idea Jimmy Dean's dead. They just think he's still selling sausage. All right. So I pour a little bit of that down there too. So we're just going to do the same thing as we've done in the other pans. Put a little bit more olive oil down in there. I sprinkled so a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper this time over the tops of these things as you whoop as you can see all right hopefully you can see and then we're just going to put them face down they've already got some oil on top of them no big deal and then what we're going to do i got to get these gloves off they are so slick, I can't handle anything now. How much foil? Double foil. Seal it in there nice and tight. There you go. All right. So now, there's only one more thing that we've got to do. 
And that's going to be how I want to experiment with my broccoli package. Let me show you what I'm going to do with that. All right, here we got some double foil down. And I've done these packages in my grills, in my smokers, you know, in the oven, and no problems. So I'm going to assume, da, 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 I'm going to assume, we're not going to have a problem out there. Worst case is I'll overcook them and they'll be mush. But I'm going to take these, all right. We've got our cut broccoli here, fresh broccoli that I've cut up. I'm a meat and potatoes man, but the old lady has to have something green. So that's green. Do some olive oil. Keep growing them olives. Keep growing them olives. It's just a drizzle. It looks like I'm putting a lot on there, but no, I'm not really. It's, this thing is just drizzling out of this big container because I only popped that just a little bit. All right. Come up. Make sure we have a good seal by twisting it. We don't want any steam generated coming out pop the end over seal it pop the end over seal it pick it up a little bit there we go so that's our package of of broccoli so that's what the meal is going to be tonight okay <laughs> well, we'll see how it goes. I'm going to have the camera out there because you got to pull these things out, some of them, and uncover them. And we'll follow along and see how they turned out. And maybe I can figure out why this dang camera, even though it's brand new, turned itself off. I have no idea. All right. Just headed toward the stove. All right, it's that time. We're gonna start cooking. First thing I gotta do is get the coal separated. I don't have my my coal brush. Why? It fell off the daggum deck and snapped right where it screwed in. So I'll use whatever I can come up with. I had one guy point out, don't push all the fire to the back. You need some on the sides. You got to cook in, in all the way around. Everybody didn't do it. Some people do it. I'm going to give it a shot. All right. So let's see how it goes. I'm going to walk over there for about four or five seconds, pick up my spatch chuck. I hate saying this. Spatch cock chicken, which is two corner tins, I keep reminding you. That'll be the first thing to go in. Here we go. Tell you what, sports fans, buy you some good gloves. All right, I'm gonna push a little bit more back on the side here. And if you're curious what the floor temp is, which I am, but no one ever says much. It's 
About eight, 860, somewhere in there. All right. About 860 over there, too, averaging out. All right. Well, I hear something going on in there. I hear some bubbling. It's been what, 30 seconds? All right, so what's the next thing that's going to go in there? It's going to take a long time. I'm thinking the taters. Let's go get them. Alright, we got our taters in there. I'll tell you what I'm waiting to do. I'm waiting to forget to put on a glove and grab one of these things. Remember last time inside? Well, no, nah, you didn't see me cooking that, but whatever. Alright, so now we've got our spatchcock chicken in there and we got our taters in there. Eh, what else could we put in there? I think I'm going to take and get the onions and put them outside here toward the edge because I don't think they're going to, I don't know how long they're going to take, but like I said, that's the whole idea of this thing. It's an experiment. You got to experiment, but I'm telling you, I don't know about the one you build, but this one can eat some wood. I give it two hours to warm up and I think that's way too much. I think I can get this thing fired up in an hour. Okay, I really do. Uh, because you're looking to get the bed warm. You're not looking to get the whole inside, I guess. I don't know how to explain it. Point is, is I'm eating some dead gum wood up. That's for sure. So, I'm going to move the camera up. Let's take a quick look what we got, how it's laid out. You can see the chicken in the middle. Got the onions to the back because they're not going to take a lot of heat, a lot of time. And I've got the taters up to the, uh, up to the front as well. Um, I don't want to rotate those. I'm going to take the chicken in about 10 minutes and rotate it and put it so that the, one, the other side's in first. But I don't think I want to do that to the uh, potatoes because uh, that'd be the handle dead in the fire. And I, I, yeah, something about that I just don't like. So we got 25 minutes on this chicken before we do anything to it whatsoever, as far as uh, taking the top off and letting it brown or stuff like that. But like I said, in about 10 minutes or so, it's 1600. That's four o'clock, so uh, at uh, 16, I think I'll do it halfway through. So at 16.15, and I'm going to give this a half hour. Now, why am I going to give it a half hour? The guy said give it 25 minutes. However, that's a uh, cast iron pan, and that cast iron pan takes a little bit to heat up. Yeah, it really does, but it's pretty hot in there. I tell you, it was 30 seconds. I put something in there, and I started hearing some sizzling. So, the only two things I got left to put in there are my tomatoes, okay, and my uh, little package of broccoli, which at this rate, I have a feeling just pass it by the front and she'll be done. <laughs> All right, let's give it some time and then we'll be back. All right, let me turn this so I can see what's going on here. Alright, getting time to turn the pan. I've moved the coals back a little bit. For those of you that are interested, it's about 690 degrees where the pan's sitting. Potato still. There's my onions. I'm not going to put the tomatoes in the package in until the very, very end, okay? 
Gonna give that 30 minutes on the chicken, take a look at it, see what the temperature is on the chicken itself with a temperature gauge, and if it's at a decent temp, then I'll start to do the browning process, all right? I do not like eating raw chicken in, neither should you. One thing, handy for moving coals around. One thing I need to do is keep this one short. But these are like five bucks, okay? So I'm going to get me another one, put me a wooden handle on it. Because these are good for moving coals around. But when you got to re remember, my oven is 36 inches deep. 36 inches. This part of the arm ain't covered, but it's exposed to heat. And it gets real, real hot in there. So I'm going to get me another one of these, put it on a stick of something, and then there we go. And I've never, by the way, I've never put the door up here yet. And I don't know if you can hear it. But man, I tell you, it's sizzling in there. I'm not moving the camera closer so you can hear. Because <laughs> I'll be getting me a second new camera with this heat coming out of here. Good Lord, I think I had a beard trim. Alright, it really doesn't matter if you see me or not. You know what I look like. Woo! Here I am. Alright. But what we've got right now is everything in the oven except for our package of broccoli. And I know if I throw that on a 700 degree floor, it'll, you know, it'll fry up pretty fast. So don't want it to do that. But we have everything in there right now. In the center, push toward the back, we have the chicken. In front of the chicken, we have the onions. They had been over to the side. But the temperature of where they're sitting right now of the floor is lower than where they were sitting. So I moved the tomatoes over there so they could have their chance. Okay. The potatoes, hey, they've been doing their thing. All right. So they're, they're doing pretty good. Uh, one thing I, I, I noticed, okay, you might want to take note of yourself. And that is that uh, I left my andiron in there. And in the process of doing that, it made it difficult to push things back. You know, yeah, I could have taken all the pots out and all the pans out and, and fished that bad boy out. But, uh, you know, it would have been hotter than uh, you know what. So uh, I just tried to work around it. So next time when I'm cooking like this versus cooking pizzas, all right, um, I'll go ahead and take that andiron out and not worry about it. Now, why would I leave it in there for pizzas? Well, it, it's pretty clear. If you're going to cook a pizza, and, and watching the hundreds of videos that I've watched, is you need a good flame going on when you're cooking your pizza, or it's going to take forever, and you're not getting that crispiness around the edges and the whole nine yards like that. So the andiron allows you to get the wood up, get some uh, um, uh, fire going, good flame going, air ventilation and all that and you'll be able to cook your pizzas really well. But for this, no, nah, I don't think so. The goal here was to, as is the goal in pizza cooking, get your floor warm or hot. Well, this is, this is the important part too. But one thing I did was, if you saw really well, I put my uh, coals all around the edges and everything like that. that. That helped out. And it's sizzling like crazy, I'm telling you. I would love to take the camera in there and let you listen to it, but this is the second new camera I've bought. I mean, it's the new camera I bought, and I don't want to buy a second one. So we'll see how things go. I'm getting ready to take it out here in a couple of minutes, and we'll take a look and see how the uh, chicken's looking, and we'll take a temp reading on it. All right? All right. It's time. Let's check the chicken, see what the temperature is on it. If it's at a decent temperature, we'll leave the uh, tinfoil off. And we'll let it start to brown, okay? Uh, what I'll do is probably add a couple of small, not logs, but a couple of small cuttings of, of wood behind it to get some flame up. If you want? I'm thinking you want flame, not just heat, okay? And we'll we'll see how that goes. Let's take a look, see what the temperature is. First thing, we're gonna get our onions out of the way. And we're going to move our tomatoes. 
You notice I'm twisting, well you can't see, but I'm twisting that handle way off to the side. I do not want to put my arm into that handle. I gotta make something a little bit more substantial than this. It's hot. I can feel it through these gloves. I cannot tell you how tender, soft that chicken is. But it's kicking 180, 185, okay? What do you want chicken to be at for sure? 165. Some people, oh, you can eat it lower than that. Go ahead. Good luck, brother. I don't eat my chicken less than 165. I'm kicking 185, 190, and it is so soft. So, yeah, tinfoil coming off. But before I do, so I don't throw wood in on top of it, on top of the chicken, I'm going to put some wood in there and get me some flames up before. Before I push the chicken back. Here's some small pieces. That's the goal. All right. I say throw wood. You never throw wood in a wood-fired oven in my book. I saw that in the video, and I understand why. Put a piece there. By the way, I wasn't wanting to mention this. I ordered this thing here off Amazon, and it's fine, it's great. But, you see a little slidey handle? It's plastic. That boy gets hot. I mean, it gets hot fast. So, be real careful if you order one of these. They're great, I would recommend one, but I'd recommend one with a caution. Tell you, nice having my own wood splitter to where I can split them to the sizes that I need, and I can take them down in a wheelbarrow and I can cut them up on my saws to short, 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 whatever. That comes in handy. Naked chicken. These are the taters. Mmm, goodness gracious. Come on. Crispy up. Right. Put our tomatoes back in. Now I've, I've taken a look at those onions. They're coming out nice. And it probably won't take 10, 15 minutes, but let's go ahead and put that in. And in doing that, I tell you what, you got to have one of these. You need to know what, you, for example, that's, that's just that 300 right there. So it shouldn't burn it real fast. 
In between these two pans, it's 428. Over there, it's 566. All right, so we're talking some pretty good differences. You need to know your 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 temperatures. Well, I think this thing was like 25, 30 bucks something. If you're gonna build one of these. You need one of these. My humble opinion. Ain't that pretty? All right. So, what are we going to do? We're going to let that go for a while. All right. And uh, once the chicken's browned up, I'll take the chicken out, put it on a platter, cover it with a tin foil that I just took off of it. And then I'm going to go through the process of making like a chicken gravy that that guy did. And I hope it turns out. Now, once again, like I said, he used vermouth. <laughs> and you really ought to check well, wood-fired chef's spatchcock chicken because when he holds up vermouth, he may... It's funny as all get out to me anyway. You know, made himself laugh, so if you can make yourself laugh, that's cool. Anyway, um, uh, can't find vermouth here in North Carolina. Not not real on a not on a dime. You gotta have it right now. Forget it. So over the next few weeks, uh, um, the old lady's gonna have a birthday, so I'm taking her someplace for for a couple of days. As we drive around and search around, we'll stop in stores to see if we can find some dry vermouth. Uh, and the guy that had that website was real nice. I sent him a uh, uh, an email going, "Hey man, you trying mind telling me I don't know do wop about the vermouth? Uh, what kind of vermouth? Can you give me a brand name? Dry, sweet, unsweet? You know what's the deal?" And he was actually real nice. And he wrote back a letter. But you can tell he ain't no he ain't no uh, low speed dude like me. Okay, he's a high speed dude. So <laughs> thanks, guy. I know you're not you're not watching, but appreciate it. Dry vermouth. Ah, it's sizzling. All right, after a brief interlude, I got a, I got a high top pan, so I might trust a little bit better. these out. We need to cover them. Put them over here on the table. We're going to let them rest. We've got two glasses. First one's got wine. Deglaze the pan. I probably should have had a little bit more water. Chicken stock. Should have more of both. Straining ain't no big deal. Get you a container. Get you a, a strainer. Tell you what, it's gonna be a big deal. That sucker, that is hot. All right, that sucker is hot. So I need more gloves. I gotta go get me a couple of towels. Let me turn you off, record, and I'll be back.
There's some nice brown crispy potatoes. Ooh, lordy. Just put the potatoes in the pan with the chicken. Oh, goodness gracious. In the words of my favorite Cajun cook, Mr. Wilson, may you rest in peace. Here's the onion. Oh, yeah, the onion. See just how tender, oh goodness gracious, Mr. Wilson. There's something else on the floor. You gotta be careful tilting it. There's my tomatoes. Oh, heck yeah. Here's my nice steamed veggies. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that be the meal tonight. I'm happy. Happy, happy, happy. See you later.